Hey bees, welcome to Guest and Gusto, SCAD's virtual series of conversations and digital content with the creators of Innovators Remaking Culture. I'm Christine Van Dyne, a professor of interior design here at SCAD. And today we're talking to designers Andrea Tremarque and Simone Ferrazin, who are known collectively as Forma Fantasma. We're also joined by curator Eric Chen. Andrea and Simone are Italian designers currently based in Amsterdam. Whether they're designing for a client or investigating alternative applications of materials, they apply the same rigorous attention to context, process, and detail to every project, with a keen eye to historical, political, and social forces. As Forma Phantasma, they have been commissioned by brands like Fendi, Max Mara Smartmax, Hermes, Established and Sons, and Lexus. And their work has been presented internationally at museums, including the Metropolitan Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, the Victoria and Albert Museum, Centre Pompidou, and the Statlick Museum. Eric is an independent curator and writer based in Shanghai, where, is he, where he is a professor of practice at the, and director of the Curatorial Lab at the College of Design and Innovation at Tanji University. From 2012 to 2019, he was the founding lead curator for design and architecture, and later curator at large for M Plus, a museum for visual culture in Hong Kong's West Kowloon Cultural District. He's currently the curatorial director for Design Miami, i.e., the Global Forum for Design. Welcome to SCAD, guys. Hi, thank you for having us. Thank yes. you guys so much for joining us. Our students are really excited about your conversation. First, let's check in with them before we get started. Hey, SCAD, which aspect of the design industry do you want to know more about? A, product design, B, art fairs, C, galleries, or D, commissions? Answer now for a chance to win a Hollywood Studios collage kit from SCAD grad Holly Raider. We'll get to your answers in a moment, and you can absolutely chat with us now and throughout the presentation. Um, with any questions, but let's get started. It is my absolute pleasure to present Forma Phantasma in conversation with Eric Chen. Hello, Great. pleasure to meet you guys. Uh, hi, Eric. Hi, guys, and, uh, and, and hello, everyone uh, out there. Uh, we, we really have to thank uh, Christine and Skad, and, and really, uh, uh, in my, on behalf of Design Miami, and I'm really here uh, in my role as Design Miami's curatorial director, we I have to uh, thank SCAD for a, a really great partnership uh, over the past uh, couple of years, I believe, and, and, and we're really happy to see it continue um, uh, via this, this platform. Uh, and we're really excited to be able to do this with uh, Andrea and Simone of, of Former Phantasma. As, as Christine mentioned, I mean, they are, they're really um, among the most compelling, uh, compelling designers working today, uh, starting early on with their work, uh, while they were still students at Eindhoven, where they continued to teach, uh, most recently the, the geo design uh, course there, but uh, early on as students and soon thereafter, they really became known for their very sort of um, research, well, research based, but very kind of rigorous and conceptually beautiful and formally beautiful uh, works uh, exploring uh, materials, materiality, crafts, uh, memory, uh, identity. Uh, in ways that, that sort of uh, formed a, a new kind of, uh, let's say, material culture uh, that, 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 uh, that, that embeds all sorts of, of meanings uh, in their objects uh, based on uh, their, the sort of uh, in-depth research that they do. Um, more recently, and we'll hear about uh, this in a second, they've been looking at uh, things like uh, global supply chains, waste streams, resource extraction, uh, through projects like their Ore Streams, uh, and most recently Cambio, which was a show uh, of theirs that opened um, in March at the Serpentine Galleries in London. I was fortunate to have been able to make it to the opening uh, just days before it was closed, uh, like everything else uh, due to the coronavirus pandemic, but hopefully it will reopen uh, at some point, and we will uh, get a, a, a real treat uh, by having them tell us a little bit about their, their work from the beginnings, uh, you'll see some common threads uh, sort of uh, appearing and, 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 and reappearing. Um, and uh, of course, any conversation these days uh, is happening in the backdrop of this uh, pandemic, uh, which has become such, uh, uh, such a, uh, a powerful uh, stress test for many of the, the human systems that Andrea and Simone have have been investigating through their work. So maybe we'll have a chance to um, reflect on that a little bit uh, as well. Now, uh, we're gonna try to do this in a sort of hybrid way, uh, kind of a cross between a presentation and a conversation. Uh, 
maybe we'll, we can call it a presentation um, <laughs> where they'll be, sorry, uh, they'll be uh, showing us, uh, taking us through their work and I might uh, interrupt now and then uh, with some questions. Normally, we would invite you to interrupt as well, but that's a bit complicated in this format, but please um, do uh, think of, of, of comments or questions that you want to ask or make, and uh, we will do our best to, uh, to bring them up towards the end of the talk. So on that note, uh, without further ado, uh, Andrea and Simone, please, please tell us about yourselves. Eric, thank you for the, the introduction and for the presentation of our work. Um, and please do interrupt us as much as you want so that to make sure to make this conversation uh, as such. Um, uh, so uh, as you said, as soon as we manage to go full screen, exactly, we will start speaking about uh, our, own, uh, our own work. So, well, this is just the, the two of us uh, when we were still in, uh, in Eindhoven, in the Netherlands, where we actually came to study uh, 10 years ago, actually 12 years ago. Um, and then we moved to Amsterdam, where we have our own studio, despite we are both, we are both Italian. Nevertheless, uh, it was quite formative for us to have this experience of studying our bachelor in Italy, which was a bit more of an academic um, uh, studies. And then coming to Eindhoven, where the, the experience of materiality and experimentation also with a hands-on approach was extremely, extremely formative. And as I mentioned before, our studio now is based in, uh, in Amsterdam, where we, we work with a team of people, both on more research-based projects, but also more commercial commission. And part of our work is also trying to bridge these two different worlds when we can, uh, and when we cannot, then keeping them uh, as, far, as far apart as possible in a way. Um, uh, we are also involved with, it, with education because we also understood that um, because of the interest of some of our work, it was also important to um, develop uh, some of these ideas within education, which still is an area where more radical ideas can, um, you know, come, uh, comes alive. So since a couple of years, we are the head of a design course in Syracuse, in Sicily, in the south of Italy. Um, and the course there is made, and of course, it's also dealing with all the problematic re related to ecology and to sustainability that are topics, all topics uh, of today's society. And since one year, uh, and we will start in September, we are going to, to have uh, a new design course at the Design Academy in Doven called Geodesign. Maybe you can spend a few words about geodesign. Uh, yes, maybe I would just mention something about geodesign and the term geodesign, they can be interpreted in several ways, but the, the, the aim of the department is really to have designers focusing not only with, in the ways we can serve to human needs or necessities, but also to, uh, through design, but also to question the way design perform and act upon an infrastructure which is existing, it is there. And I'm thinking, for instance, the way materials are extracted, transported, distributed, and to question, in fact, the, really the impact that design have in the environment, for instance, in terms of, of course, of, uh, um, you know, in, in processing uh, materials and, and so on. And um, by giving probably an, an important part that will be a part of the, 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 the idea of non-humans, so, and, uh, and the kind of interaction we can have with these non-humans, uh, especially when it comes to production. So I think that would be something that would be part of very embedded within the, the design discourse in, in geodesign. What they're referring to. Can, can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by non-humans? Yes. Sure. So I think historically the design discipline has been focusing extremely on sort of human-centered design in the, best of, in the best of the occasion, I would say. Um, and thinking also, you know, in which ways we can, we design, you know, as I said before, improving the life of, of, of humans. Nevertheless, when we think about ecology, it also means understanding deeply that our survival and our uh, well-being in the world as humans depends also on other species. That if other species are also equally um, respected and taken care of, then we can all live, you know, in a, in a, in a uh, sound environment. Um, in this sense, when we talk about design as taking care also of non-humans, we are specifically referring to others 
living species like plants and, and, and mm. animals and fungi and all the other living species on, on the planet and thinking which ways design can become less anthropocentric, which is a question that is difficult to answer, but it's also why we want to put it forward within an education, which we don't see an occasion to sort of teach to students, but actually to discuss with them how to develop issues that actually cannot have a life really in the outside world. Great. <clears throat> so I think you're going to tell us about some of those those projects that, that yes. sort of steered you in this direction. Uh, we will, and we'll start actually with our graduation works. We will just focus very briefly at the beginning on a few works and move on to uh, Or Streams and Cambio, our latest works, because uh, we thought it was interesting in any case to, to say a few words where we started. And actually, these are pictures of our graduation work from 2009 when we were still students um, in, in Eindhoven. And it's a work that looked into the tradition of uh, ceramic in, in Sicily and uh, looks into its relationship and the connections to um, migration flows, racism, and actually how uh, the <coughs> development of um, ceramic in the Mediterranean area was linked to um, the, the um, uh, and influenced by African Arabs migrations uh, and, and settlements in, in Sicily and in Spain and linking it to, to the contemporary issues of um, um, uh, the, the refugee crisis in, uh, in Europe. Um, and the, the starting of the work was actually the found, founding uh, a very renewed, well-known artwork in Sicilian tradition, which is a, a, face, a, a vase with a face of an African Arab which is, um, it can result extremely racist. And we somehow departed from this, this um, uh, traditional artifact to address these political issues. Um, and in a way, in this case, for instance, we're looking at the materiality, but not in terms of possibility from a technical level, but actually more from the connotations that, for instance, ceramic and maiolica have in a specific locality, and it's linked to nationalism and so on. Yeah, like I, I think maybe especially, uh, especially uh, you know, this work was done uh, uh, almost well uh, ten years ago now, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and as we all know, the conversation around issues of appropriation has has certainly um, de developed since then. And, and and I think it's probably important to note that here, you know, you're you're not really appropriating. You're more. It seems. And please correct me if I'm wrong. You're 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 reflecting upon or critiquing. Uh, earlier forms of of of, uh, of uh, appropriation and and and, and representation. Uh, absolutely, um, I think it is even. I mean, we sadly we we uh, we cannot uh, you know explain in depth the the work because it's very layered. But we are also looking, for instance, in how much tradition is often in craft. The idea of craft is often constructed, and how, uh, for instance. Uh, uh, in the specific case of, of craft in Sicily, there is this strange relationship where artisans repeat the past and they see uh, in the repetition of the past without a critical attitude as a way of protecting local culture when they don't even understand the local culture in Sicily is based actually on migration flows. Those same migration flows that nowadays they, they are often refused because they are perceived as a threat to the local culture. So in this, in this sort of nonsensical and complex relationships, we thought that design could play a role, especially because traditional craft is, is used by nationalist um, politics to um, sort of, um, you know, um, uh, simplify very complex issues that should be discussed uh, with, much, with much more depth. The second project is that we are presenting is called Botanica, and it's a project from 2011 that we presented in Milan uh, during Salone. And uh, something that is important, there was a commission from a foundation in Naples that is called PLART. And uh, it's very important in Italy, this foundation, because it's, uh, it's a foundation that is um, dedicated to the restoration and conservation of objects in, in plastic. So what we did there uh, in this project is to look in the moment that we call pre bakelite so before the actual invention of plastic coming from, from petrol. In all those like um, materials, they were all coming from vegetable, vegetal or animal derivatives. Um, all these, uh, so let's say these are almost pre-industrial plastic. 
And we did this object as if, uh, you know, the uh, so-called natural area never happened. So what, what would have happened if plastic was not coming from petrol? And uh, so this collection of objects are um, portraying a series of different kind of like natural plastic that comes from uh, shellac. Um, that is pro probably, you all know, it's a small box that is a um, colonizing tree and is producing this uh, highly refined plastic. Or uh, what you see that is a mix between uh, sawdust and animal blood and with uh, high pressure and uh, warm becomes like an art plastic and other materials. The idea of the work was really to sort of understand where the sort of the history of polymers started and understand if possibly some of this material could, could have a relevance for the contemporary, contemporary time. And we, we continue for several years in the investigation in these materials, which uh, sadly at one point stopped because our resources was also limited in a way, which also shows the limitations of what design can do if not supported, I would say, by um, you know, larger economies. Um, the, so you, as you see, there was already a transition between modern tradition and botanica where uh, it's two body of works that looks at two materials, but from different perspectives. And the third one, which is doing the same, is the Natura Fossilium that we developed a few years later, which looks again in relationship between materials and locality. Again, it's based on a, uh, in, in Sicily, uh, but from a different perspective. Uh, while modern tradition was much more social political, here it is much more about looking in the possibility of a specific uh, um, context. In this case, the Etna volcano which is one of the few um, active volcano in, uh, in Europe, uh, which uh, often, um, you know, it is uh, exploding and uh, releasing debris, as you see in the picture with the, with the street. And, uh, but the mountain is only used as entertainment for tourists, basically. And instead we were looking at it as a mine, but we know miners. The idea here was thinking, well, basically the mountain is mining itself and exposed materials. What can we actually do with these debris? And in a way, uh, our attempt here was also to question the relationship that uh, a lot of people have with the southern regions of Italy, which are seen as, you know, entertainment for tourists and, and less as a place for production, and questioning really this and, and trying to understand what we could do with this, with this material. And we developed a collections of objects which were ranging from collaborations with local craftsmen, <laughs> but also investigating with uh, scientific centers, for instance, the possibility of using these ashes from a volcano for the production of glass objects, which is something that we continue in the years. This instead is a collaboration with local craftsmen for the productions of basalt-based uh, uh, objects. And in the case of textile, the mixing of cotton fibers with lavic fibers, because from lava you can also obtain fibers very similar to, to, to glass fibers. And, um, and later in the years, we develop instead, we apply this research to a much more um, sort of um, industrial process. So while the entry of the scene started as a commission from a gallery, the sellers and the works were also shown also in Design Miami in, uh, in Basel. Um, uh, with, uh, with the same research, we continue with a brand called uh, uh, Zach, based in London, with whom we develop a series of uh, tiles which are glazed with, uh, with the uh, ashes from the volcano. And the interesting side of these applications is that we always have to consider that the majority of glazes that we use for ceramic are uh, extractive. While of course in this case, because the, the volcano is sort of exposing these materials, it's non-extractive -extra uh, glazes. So it is also interesting. Eric, I see you. Uh, no, no, well, I, I was just wondering if, 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 if this volcanic ash is also from Mount Etna, because you're both from Southern Italy, no? Like from no, I'm well, from South of Italy. Simone is from Venice, so it's from the north. Ah, okay, so you're north-south. Uh. Exactly. <laughs> right. So, but it comes very often to Sicily, so that's why we are a lot of time like reflecting to Sicily. It's kind of also very interesting as, a, as, a, as an island because of course it's an island, but also it has a very different history in terms of like development compared to the rest of Italy and to the rest of Europe. So it's really craft-based, it's still an agricultural region, but not so much industry. So it's quite kind of an interesting place to see reflect to uh, about certain issues. And uh, yes, the ashes are still coming from the Etna volcano for for this project too. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting to me how for you, I mean, there is always like a history embedded in, in your work, right? But that history spans uh, kind of geological time, you know, to sort of human time, uh, to, the, to, to uh, one's, one's own experience or, or, or even your, your own personal uh, mm -hmm. uh, backgrounds. I mean, uh, like how, how, how do you sort of negotiate these different scales of, of history or do you see them as, as being um, uh, acting simultaneously? Well, they definitely act simultaneously for us, and also uh, the well that that's where the negotiation is done through intuition. That's where you know the um, I think one part of of you know our work is also to see links between things and to see patterns where others don't see that. And and I think this is a you know relevant part of the design that they can see. Uh, these connections between things where, you know, and to see potentials where others don't see it. And in, in this case, the, the work also sort of shit, shifted over time. So when, for instance, we, we developed the, the tile, let's say that other aspects became relevant compared to the initial project in Natura Facilium. So in a way, what we find interesting in this specific work is not anymore necessarily or exclusively the connection to, to the specific locality, Sicily. But it is also that um, we were trying to develop a, a sort of commercial product, which wasn't based on a preconceived idea of the aesthetic result that we would have obtained. What I mean to say is that when we started this process with Brent, the owner of, of, of the brand we worked with, um, we didn't know which kind of aesthetic result we would have obtained at the end which is something which is, for instance, for the developer we worked with, completely absurd because they are questioning, like, what, what's the point of doing something that you don't really know what's, it, what's the aesthetic outcome? Because often design is, sees, is seen as a service to the development of product based on something that is, of course, aesthetic. But in this case, for us, it was much more important the process that leads to that result and, and deciding to commit to a locality, which is a parameter and the idea of non-extractive uh, glazing, for instance, which is parameters which are underestimated because, of course, design is often used as a tool for busting economy. Do you know what I mean? And making and glamorizing objects, which is not what we're doing with this process. Okay, yes, but, uh, but, but on that note, uh, I, I see here that the, win, the winning answer to the, the poll, uh, the, the student poll, was that the, the, the students um, are all most interested in product design. Uh, and, you know, it, it, in the context of, of, of what you were just saying, you know, what, you, know, what, what you, you guys are so good at, or one of the many things you're so good at is sort of turning uh, research and bodies of knowledge or new ways of looking at uh, uh, or questioning, questioning bodies of knowledge, really translating that into uh, uh, really beautiful objects. Now, um, in, in some ways, you know, you're, uh, these objects are manifestations of that, of, 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 of that research. And, and I wonder, uh, while your focus is not on, on the aesthetics, the, the, perhaps the, 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 your process naturally leads to a very uh, aesthetically pleasing result. And, and, and um, as cultural objects, I mean, is, is that notion of, uh, that, that innate notion of aesthetics related to the fact that these are cultural objects or conduits for culture, as you guys uh, uh, often call them? Uh, and, and, and to what extent then do you see the relationship between culture and, and let's say beauty. I mean, uh, nowadays we, 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 we're almost uh, afraid to talk about aesthetics yeah, and, yeah, and beauty as, as if it's sort of superficial or, 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 or frivolous, but, uh, but maybe it's not. I, I, sorry, go. No, no, well, it's a very complicated question because I remember actually when we were doing our graduation and you know, we started in Holland and it's one of the most pragmatic a place Calvinist. in the world and Calvinist, you know, where beauty, you know, you can't even say this word. And we never understood that because actually coming from a place where, you know, beauty is considered as much important as another value, you know, it's uh, like Italy. Um, we never had that discussion actually about beauty. Um, I think Paolo Antonelli recently said something about beauty, which I thought it was incredible and answers all the questions. So let's, she let's said, do the Paola. I feel so it does, yes. Uh, she said, Paul Ali, you know, who's the senior curator at, at, at the Museum of Modern Art uh, yes, in New York, and, and, and a longtime supporter of, of Andrea and, and Simone. True, very, very much true. Uh, and she said the opposite of uh, beauty. It is not ugly. 
it is laziness. And I think this answers all the, the questions because the, the fact that our work leads to, or the, there's also like some uh, beauty into the work is because, and maybe also challenging the, the, the idea what is beautiful or not, it is because we put effort in the process we follow. And we don't think that there's only um, uh, intellectuals way to understanding things, but you can understand things also through uh, how things look. And our attempt with our work is to vehiculate ideas also through materiality. Yeah. So for us, that's, that's equally important for us to, to explore things through forms because you can also communicate different ideas. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes, and I think the case of our stream that we are going to present next, it's a good example. The research, it's almost more important than the final outcomes. But then also for our stream, we got to a moment in which we had to get back to the objects. So we had to make the extra step that also causes a lot of troubles sometimes when you do that, that step. So um, this idea of like not only presenting the research, or not thinking that the research is enough, I think it's for us, is probably what makes us uh, doing also beautiful object at the end. There is a commitment in, into that almost. Um, yeah, so I go yeah. ahead with the uh, or spring because we don't yeah, touch right, no, time, so we need to go for it. So um, maybe we can introduce the, the work. Yeah. Uh, first of all, the context of the work, because I think it is extremely important always to understand things in context and, in, and this context was a commission from a museum in uh, Australia, the National Gallery of Victoria, and it was later becoming a commission uh, from uh, Paolo Antonelli, again, the senior curator of the MoMA, for Broken Nature exhibition in, in Milan. And it was also later uh, exhibited uh, very short after um, in, uh, in Basel as part of an exhibition curated by uh, Eric. And uh, what was interesting of the conversation we had with the curators there is that a museum in this moment is interested in acquiring uh, pieces of furniture in their collection, but they wanted to give commissions to the, to the designers they were having a conversation with to develop new bodies of work. And they were at the same time interested in our research-based process. And we thought of linking this to, um, to, to Australia somehow because the work was exhibited there. And Australia is uh, still one of the, a few, first world countries that are still having an economy largely based on the extractions of minerals from the underground. So we wanted to connect to that. And for the first time, I think, we really departed doing a, a body of work where we knew that we wanted to be much more critical with our process, but also with, um, with sort of the political agenda of the work itself. And uh, in particular, we looked into uh, the complex relationship there is between design and the extractions of minerals for production, um, not only in Australia, but as a general hyper subject. And in the process of developing this, we decided to focus on to not really the extractions of mineral from the underground, but the recuperations of minerals from the above ground in with what we, everybody calls urban mining, specifically focusing on electronic waste, which is the largest stream of waste, uh, sorry, the, not, not the largest, but the fastest growing stream of waste globally. So it's not the biggest, but the one that is speeding up the, the quickest. And the reason why we wanted to focus onto that is also because here there is a huge design challenge because electronic waste is, um, you know, it is so complex and needs to, to a lot of labor in its recycling. Uh, because essentially it is that the product are badly designed for recycling, um, causing extremely um, global problems, uh, such as, for instance, the dumping of electronic waste in the so-called developing countries. Uh, we hate this word, but it's, you know, I haven't found a better way of defining other than Western countries. Um, and um, causing problems for the laborers and the, um, and, and the environment. Um, the reason why, as I said before, these products are often exported from the US or, or Europe, it's because they're extremely complex to, to recycle. Uh, fortunately, since the end of the 90s, uh, laws enter in, in, in place to ban the exportation, the responsible exportation of electronic waste. Uh, even if electronics is still uh, sadly exported in developing countries, uh, I think to the point that the 70% is still not properly recycled. So 
Our aim was really to look into this complex subject and to structure the research in order to understand what design, in which part design can connect as a, as a, as a, to provide solutions for, for this problem. And so we looked into the formal recycling sector, so how the electronics are recycled in proper plants in Europe, uh, essentially, that's where we looked into, the informal recycling sector in, um, in developing countries, uh, and also looked into um, uh, the important subject of how legislation uh, develop tools to, um, to, to, to solve these problems. Uh, the way we, we, we developed this project was in, uh, over the course of basically a few years, um, reaching out, reading pu published materials, and also reaching out a variety of different practitioners that could help us really understand the complexity of the, of the problem. We also engaged in conversation with, of course, um, uh, producer of electronics, yeah. In this case, Fujix Xerox. Um, and of course, recyclers, as said before, and uh, NGOs and uh, several other practitioners that helped us really understand the complexities of the subject. So what we did, uh, so the exhibition, let's say, they was composed into essentially two parts. One part was like a multimedia installation where all these interviews were, um, were shown. Uh, and uh, we also did a website with all the archive material, all the, uh, the law, all the, um, the text, all the uh, website uh, news that were happening while we were developing the project are uh, showcased in the, in the website. But of course, um, also, as I said, the interview with all the people. And uh, in the installation, especially in the multimedia installation, the video installation, there were a couple of videos. Uh, there were, uh, for instance, this one, they were about the dismantling of electronic waste. It was uh, almost tool that we were using when we were discussing with uh, recyclers in order to understand which, are, which were the problematic uh, related to the dismantling of um, certain kind of product from TV, TV to uh, phones or uh, PC. Uh, or of course also um, washing machines. Washing machines. Um, in the show there were also some videos that were much more transformative or more informative. This is the case, the more informative one was the one of the planet obsolescence where we uh, showcase a series of um, examples on how companies nowadays are using planet obsolescence to make the objects dying uh, earlier than, um, than how they are supposed than, yeah. to perform. Exactly. But the, I think the, the most important uh, part of the exhibition was the object that we will show later and a uh, animation where we piled up a series of very pragmatic strategies that we compiled, researching all these different, these different sector. And we are maybe um, showing a short clip of the animation and we'll speak over it so that we can briefly describe uh, just a few of these very simple things that, that could have potentially an impact in the recycling and the repairing of electronics. Great. So uh, mm, one of the things that are uh, sort of um, the most complicated when disassembling electronics is that, as I said before, there is a need of a lot of labor. And uh, one of the complex part is that often electronics are, uh, are designed to do not be disassembled. So one of the things, for instance, we are advocating for is the introduction of a universal screwing system. Uh, one of the things we came to know is that some brands customize their own screw to make sure actually that the user is not able to open the electronics to actually fix it. Uh, in developing countries, this is also a problem because fewer tools are often available. And this means that uh, often the product needs to be uh, broken to remove the, the components. But in this process, also the, the other components breaks and renders them uh, are not recyclable. Uh, the results often need um, uh, an, a irresponsible use of materials. So for instance, one of the process to divide waste in this moment in recycling centers, the use of different technologies and different systems, such as for instance, water separation or the use of magnets. But for instance, concrete in, um, in washing machine is often um, mixed with iron to make the, the washing machine more stable. But this means that in the process of recycling, magnets recognize uh, concrete as, as iron and contaminates the, that stream of waste. Um, the excess of safety can also be a problem. So for instance, the use of fire retardant is uh, often used also where it, when it is not needed in order to pass quickly the safety test. 
and this renders, for instance, plastic, plastic unrecyclable. So the correct applications of hydroretardant would, would, for instance, make the percentage of plastics recycled uh, much more, much more uh, efficient. Um, we are also advocating for introductions of a uh, QR code system to uh, create a, a digital passport. So for instance, recyclable, uh, recyclers will know actually what they are recycling. One of the problems in this moment is the plastic is engineered daily. So often recyclers do not really know the plastic they are recycling and they need to construct their own lab to test the plastics. In developing countries, this is problematic. So really rudimental techniques are used, such as burning plastics to recognize the composition from the colors of the flame or from the fumes, which is of course uh, heavily polluting uh, both for the environment and the laborer. I will now continue describing other of these strategies, but there's, you can uh, access the website uh, rstreams.com if you want to know more and if you want to watch the, uh, the movie. Great. I'm coming back to the presentation. Yes. Um, For the work, we also develop a series of other videos which are much more looking um, contextually at the history of metal uh, extractions on, on planet Earth that has the aim to sort of zoom out and look at the problematic from a much bigger lens than just the focus on electronic waste. And these are some pictures of the exhibition where I introduce both the videos and the, and the object. Now we are maybe gonna spend a few words on the object. This was the exhibition at uh, Design Miami, Arik. Um, that you curated. Yes, and it was, it was so good to have Orsoons as part of that. I mean, um, just, just to give a little context, we um, wanted to do, uh, we wanted to sort of focus the discussion uh, at Design Miami in Basel, Switzerland last year um, uh, around the sort of notion of, uh, of, of, uh, of Earth, but, but Earth sort of, you know, um, and, uh, seen from a, a multiplicity um, of ways, Earth in the context of uh, this sort of condition now in which we need to not only find, um, you know, real, let's say, solutions uh, to some of these issues, but also acknowledge that these issues are, especially about sustainability, some of them are too complex to be quote unquote solved, right? And, and so um, this is as much a practical and political uh, and social issue as it, as it is a cultural and, and uh, conceptual one. So we need to sort of rethink how we even think about um, uh, our, 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 our impact on the planet and our relationship with the planet, uh, going back to this non-human idea that you guys brought up uh, at the beginning. Uh, we wanted to look at how um, the distinctions, or sort of the, the conventional distinctions between uh, consumption and production uh, and raw material and waste are, are, are dissolving, but also the, the distinctions between uh, natural and artificial, right? Uh, I mean, I, I love your um, your earlier project, the the, the Botanica um, pieces made from uh, made uh, made from a post a pre petrol uh, pre petroleum uh, sort of speculative uh, era, uh, but you know we have to remember that oil it comes from plants uh, plant matter uh, as well. So at, at what point does that that natural become uh, synthetic? So looking forward, we had other projects, um, like I think this image that you see here uh, at the front is uh, Shahar Livna, actually also an Eindhoven graduate uh, whose metamorphism project uh, looks at this kind of Anthropos, the, uh, this Anthropocene era that, that, that I'm sure many people uh, have, have, have heard of. Uh, what she does is she mixes uh, bits of plastic with minerals and then kind of compresses them under uh, heat and pressure to kind of mimic, in, in, in a way, uh, the Earth's geological processes as a way of, uh, of, of, of finding uh, sort of uh, constructive alternatives uh, in a future in which uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, plastics and other man-made materials are now part of the, the planet's uh, uh, stratigraphy, you know, so, so what is sort of raw material, what is waste. Um, the next project is uh, by Erez Navipana. Uh, who, like Shahar, is Israeli <laughs> and a graduate of Eindhoven. This is not done on purpose. Um, and uh, he made, made this series of furniture uh, by dunking a, a wooden frame wrapped in loofah into uh, these water evaporation pools uh, at the Dead Sea Works. Now, the, the, the Dead Sea Works is a sprawling kind of manufacturing 
um, uh, facility or really landscape that 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 is uh, turning the the Dead Sea uh, in Israel uh, into a kind of into a kind of wasteland. Really, I mean, it's uh, it's extracting uh, its mineral rich uh, saline waters to get potash and other things. Um, uh, and as a result, the, the, the Dead Sea is shrinking and you have these massive uh, evaporation pools of essentially wastewater. So he uh, dunked them to, na to, to literally kind of crystallize that, that, that high saline waste into furniture. Uh, once again, kind of questioning these, these, these uh, blurring uh, boundaries between uh, raw, raw material waste and uh, production and, and, and consumption. Beautiful. And so we're, we're, I, I actually spoke too much because I, I see we're running low on time and, and we really have to get to Cambio, uh, your, your, your latest project. But, but, but here are we'll some really- there, I think, because uh, I mean, it's a complex project, but I think uh, we can explain it in a, in a second, a, a bit of it. Maybe we just finished to our stream because of course we introduced also the object. So maybe we should spend a few words here and then we can just go ahead uh, to Cambio. Sure. We, uh, for the Objects of War streams, we produce a series of office furniture that are where produced with, entirely with um, recycled um, uh, metals, not only coming from electronic waste, uh, but the, the objects are featuring uh, also within the, their, their body, not only recycled materials in terms of really of the metal we used, but also details such as, for instance, this, this is um, a grate that comes from a, a microwave or a pile of iPhones, shells, empty shells to support the, the table, or in the case of this piece, the, um, the leftover from, a, from a, um, uh, a keyboard from a computer as a support, as a functional support for the, for the, for the desk. Um, the, the pieces do not work as a solution for what we we, for our research, the solution somehow is the, are the strategies. But the, I think the pieces are more trying to, to look at the different narrative and to look, for instance, at the tensions between a material which is uh, obviously, or it looks completely, for instance, new and without trace of any information and other elements which are obviously uh, clearly screaming, I am a piece of recycle <laughs> something. And, and for us, the combinations of these two elements create a, a, one is supposed to question the other. And so where is the other materials are coming from? What, 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 is, what is it actually made of? And uh, the, some of the pieces are also have prints of, of the surface of, of Mars. And it's a reference to uh, how uh, metals ended up on, on planet Earth through rains of meteorites that crashed on the surface of the planet. And a lot of precious metals that are existing on the upper surface of the planet, the one we actually are extracting, are basic, basically of alien origin. So somehow it's, it's a way of completely zooming out. And details of the pieces that are were all plated in gold, which looks very fancy, is actually um, gold that we scavenged from um, circuit boards of uh, electronic products. And... Wait. Uh. We uh, are Cambio, the, yes, the, and we are we are, we are shifting out from the presentation because um, again, for as for our streams, we develop a, a website that, that comes together with the exhibition and the catalog of the exhibition because we think part of our responsibility as designers when we do this research project, it is not only to develop works or products or exhibition, but also to make the the body of research available for, for others that could use it and to, could appropriate it. So it is an invitation to make use of what we have been researching and to actually maybe continue even our research process. And the um, Cambio was a commission from Serpentine Galleries in London, which is a museum, and the, the usually present art and not design. The, this is the, only the third design exhibition they do. And what was interesting about the commission that Azuri gave us, Azuri Covers, the director of Serpentine, was to not necessarily focus on the product, uh, but to, um, for him, what is interesting of showing works within Serpentine is to show the way of thinking of designers and the issues and, and that they are interested in, not necessarily finalizing into 
into finished objects. And for us, that was an interesting commission because this is how I think uh, art galleries could commission design. So to go beyond the, the finished, uh, the finished uh, product. Um, and in this case, we decided to focus on onto timber because, uh, well, from, for practical reasons, but also because we felt that through the investigation of timber, we could address, for instance, what we were talking about before, this idea of the, the intelligence, but also the needs of other than humans beings. Because when you produce with wood, of course you produce with living species. And so the exhibition gave us this chance to look into, into this uh, subject more, more closely. An entire exhibition is a continuous collaboration with a variety of practitioners. Um, from scientists uh, of different kinds to lawmakers, to activists, to, to a philosopher and a dendroclimatologist and in, in the Victorian Albert Museum, so institutions such as uh, the Victorian Albert and the Kew Gardens. So it was a way to gather almost a family of different practitioners to look essentially to the infrastructure that we as designers often give it for granted. So which are the politics and the forces that are really shaping the industry of timber. And we think as designers, we should be aware of, of this industry and how it operates to possibly be much more self-conscious when we, when we work. Well, of course, the exhibition is quite complex. So, and of course we can also go through it, but something that is important to know that because the exhibition is closed at the moment, and thanks God, we thought that since the beginning to do this website, the website works almost like as online exhibition. So you can find all the material, all the videos, all the objects we produce, all the interviews, all the archive. It's a very rich website where you can access to all the uh, information about the exhibition. Plus, uh, on our Instagram, that is from a Phantasma, uh, daily we are posting part of the research that is not necessarily going or is within the exhibition. These are extra bits from the research we did during the uh, exhibition times. And weekly, we are doing a series of talk, uh, live talks with some other people we collaborated with in the process of the, uh, of the exhibition. So we are trying to use a multi-platform to, to, let's say, uh, dealing with the topics we are uh, discussing within Cambio. Um, maybe, I mean, it's a very complex exhibition. Um, Maybe we can take only one part uh, and extend it a bit. And then for the rest, I mean, guys, you can, of course, have the time to, to go through it. Or maybe, Arik, if you have any question, we can On maybe- the show. No, uh, I'll go ahead. I, I think it's good for you to, to give everyone a, a teaser. Sure. Well, maybe, so we can explain sort of the, 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 the first part of the show, which is the one we call the forensic part, where we, uh, we collaborated with the center here in Amsterdam they calculate the quantity of CO2 stored within wood. And with the center, the Tuning Institute in Germany, they instead do forensic analysis on, uh, on material samples to understand the specimen of timber used and possibly, when possible, the origin of, the, of that species. And the, these collaborations uh, sort of were visualized in, in uh, several installations. This one is one where we um, copied uh, one stool of IKEA in several, and repeated it by using several different um, uh, specimens of, of timber. And the, the way the, the stools are, are piled up are from the, 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 the species that is growing and rich maturity the quickest to the one that rich maturity the latest. And um, we used to calculate when the tree reached maturity, also when the tree absorbed at its maximum CO2, because if we all believe that trees, you know, are important for the well-being of our planet because they absorb CO2, we should also let them live enough to, to serve to this purpose. And this basically means that, to give an example, the stool at the bottom is supposed to live for uh, at least, uh, to survive at least for 40 years. Why 40 years? Well, because the tree that used to produce that stool um, should live at least 40 years. And in order to have a coherent um, CO2 emission and absorption, because when you throw away wood, possibly it will be incinerated, and so CO2 will be released again in the atmosphere, then the tree, the, the stool should outlive the life of the tree. The last stool, which is oak, which is a very common tree, should, uh, and a species of timber used for production, should at least live 90 years. 
of course, the installation is a critique on the way materials are applied. And more, more than that, even, is this business model uh, that is often, uh, is often used, which is speeds up the, um, and increase the, the speed of production to the point that objects basically are so cheap that it's quicker and better in a way to discard them in the case, for instance, you need to move than and keeping it and moving it or repairing it. And the same we did also with an installation with paper objects. Um, this other installation is that is, uh, do you want to Yeah, it? so what we did is to collect a series of objects in, uh, in the European market from Germany, uh, UK, uh, Germany, UK uh, and the Netherlands. Netherlands and Belgium in one year time. And then we ask uh, the Tuner Institute to analyze, to understand if the species were correctly labeled uh, or if they are coming from illegal uh, sourcing. Because you need to know that the 30% of all the wood species that comes through European Union every year, it comes from illegal sourcing. Um, so in a way, this installation want to, want to um, address the fact that the most of the objects they are surrounding us actually are not coming uh, from a conscious uh, way of producing. Yeah. yeah, great. Well, this was just the beginning of the exhibition. But. And then you continue with dealing with the issues related to um, colonialism, colonialism uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Legislation and yeah. others. Yeah. No, I, I have to say it, it, it was it, 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 and is uh, an incredible exhibition and uh, really an, an, an incredible resource that you have this all online. And, and I hope everyone uh, has a chance to, to, to dive a bit deeper uh, on the website. Um, I think now uh, we have just a little time for me to pass this back to Christine for uh, the students' questions, but maybe as we're doing the, the, the handover, um, I'll, I'll just ask you guys one question because we, we are speaking mostly to, to students. Um, and, and obviously it's, it's never been easy starting one's own practice as a designer, especially one uh, with, um, with, uh, uh, with, with, with such wide ranging uh, interests uh, uh, as, as, as you guys. I mean, you talked about uh, a little bit earlier about separating your sort of commercial uh, research and e education work. Maybe you can just talk a little bit more about how those, how, well, wh how and why you separate them, but also where they come together. Because um, I, I'm sure there's, there are students uh, out there who, who wanna know how you've managed to, to make your, your practice work, you know, having started it immediately from school. Yeah. Well, regarding how we made it work, at the beginning, you know, we started our studio in 2009, at the end of 2009. So it was really in the middle of the other economic uh, crisis we, we re recently right. had. And, uh, you know, there is something that is happening when you finish studying. You don't really have a lot to lose. So, uh, because you're already basically broke and, and <laughs> that situation, despite it's problematic, it can also be a possibility because, um, uh, we find we thought it was much easier to uh, compromise less at the beginning than now, because the more you grow a bit as a studio and also with years, you you know you want to sustain a certain lifestyle, but also you are, you know you have to pay other people, so you need, you need to make sure that your studio works financially. At the beginning, you don't have that, and I think it is better to stick to what you believe in and what you think it is important than compromising immediately. Um, then sort of, there are moments where I think it is easier to sort of find a bridge between the more experimental and the less experimental, and the Tiles project is an example of that. Um, nevertheless, for instance, in the course of the years, we have been asked by several industrial design companies that deals with furniture to, to work with them, but the conversation was often very shallow. Uh, and so um, we understood that there are limitations <laughs> when you get some new commissions, and so uh, either in that case, we try to, to do intelligent products, but they do not try to be revolutionary on the t in, in, the, in the sense that we think something is revolutionary. Um, and to establish possible long lasting conversation with these companies so that uh, over time, you can start to become more radical with them. And we are starting to have some of these conversations with the companies we work with. Um, and we are establishing other conversations thanks to Cambio with other companies that we always admired and then where we think actually we could do something for these companies. And so it is a constant negotiation. Uh, and uh, we think that only in the course of time we will be able to, 
sort of show also on a bigger scale what we are capable of as, as designers. Uh, in the meantime, we have this pillar of the more independent works, the education, and the collaborations with, with more commercial um, companies, where we try in any case to inject relevant ideas in those projects too. Great. <laughs> no, you guys are, are great examples of, 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 of how, all, how you can stay true to yourself uh, and, and also uh, as, as trite as this may sound, you know, uh, find opportunity in, uh, in any situation. Um, and on that note, I, I think uh, it's, uh, I, I think I, I need to hand this over to Christine. Yeah. Um, I do have a couple of questions from the students to you guys, for you guys. Um, the first is for Andrea and Simone. Um, it's from Kevin, who's a furniture design uh, major. He's getting his BFA and he's intrigued by how you guys start your design process, specifically um, with materiality, where you get your inspiration from mater for uh, materiality and then also how you um, kind of would suggest students going about and exploring the idea of materiality a little bit deeper. Well, how to start a project is uh, the one that I think is the, it's the most difficult part is actually really deciding the topic. And we, we ourselves, we struggle a lot at the beginning of our investigation, but we also see in general, also when we teach, you know, deciding the topic and the focus is the most difficult part of the process. Um, well, in terms of inspiration, um, we are people that are really immersed in the world we are living in. So I think when we do research, we try to understand which are the most important topic that maybe at the beginning looks very um, irrelevant or really um, contextual, but then we understand that they can have an impact on a large scale. I make an example. When we were doing our investigation for our graduation moving tradition, uh, the Im immigration from the North Africa to, to Europe was at the beginning, was really starting around 2008, 2009. In, that, in those years, we understood clearly that that was becoming one of the biggest problems uh, for all the nationalists uh, that was coming after. Uh, and we started embarking that project already at the beginning because we thought it was relevant. And I remember some comment from our teacher at the time, it was really like- We're questioning the relevance of that and why we were doing with that, which was a, for, for them too much of a regional topic. But, you know, um, there is always a sort of a, a ping pong between a sort of an intuition and an interest, which is personal and the evaluation of the relevance that that has yeah, beyond then, yourself. Yeah, exactly. Because you're never designing for your own self. Otherwise you want, you know, you are uh, entertaining yourself with the work. But the work is not about entertaining yourself. Um, and um, yeah, I'm not sure we replied to the question fully, but. <laughs> I think you got the basics there, though. Um, and then I know we're running short on time, but I have a good question from Akshay. He is an industrial design um, master's student. Um, and he is asking, what kind of approach should designers have post-pandemic, and what should their priority be towards society? Well, uh, I think this is, uh, this is definitely a very good question. Um, I think it is also up to, to you to you know, find what you think should be the designer's attitude post-pandemic, uh, in, in which way we can, you know, as designers improve society is also depending on individual perspectives, of course. From our perspective, I think that with the pandemic is showing some critical issues. They were already critical before, and now they are totally clear. So I think it is no longer enough to do pretty objects because it, that will not, that will not survive. I think the sort of the shallowness of certain ideas are unbearable in this moment. And I think the understanding in which way, for instance, we can help to, to uh, um, heal some broken relationship. And again, I'm, I'm refer, referring to the exhibition of Paolo Antonelli, Broken Nature. And maybe that is a good idea to suggest to look into broken nature as a, as a source of inspiration for the world post pandemic. I think it is in trying, for instance, to take care of the relationship with the environment, of course, which is obvious that it's a problematic one since also the pandemic was caused by a irresponsible way of treating forests, for instance. So I think the, the pandemic is just magnifying issues which were already there. 
Um, and in, in the context of the urban environment, I think there's plenty to, to do because I think we, the pandemic also show how badly urban environment is designed, uh, isolating people in ways that is completely unbearable in times of a lockdown, for instance. So there's a lot of design can do in, for instance, making sort of complex uh, situation much more bearable from the way the houses are designed and from the way, uh, for instance, people can interact more even in, during a lockdown, which is dreadful you in this food. moment. I mean, I don't want to be catastrophic, but you know, the Anthropocene is actually what we are living in, in these days with the pandemic. I mean, this is gonna be the first of the, you know, the numerous lockdown we are gonna experience in our life, maybe not for a virus, maybe for a shortage of water or a shortage of food. So we need to rethink completely the way we are gathering food, gathering water, uh, producing object, traveling. I mean, we need to completely reinvent. And in a way, it's also very exciting because it's the right moment in which we can really do it and do it very differently. It really is a phenomenal time to be in design. There's so uh, much room for innovation so. right now and rethinking. Um, Eric, I have a question for you from Karen. Um, she wants to know what the theme of Design Miami will be this fall and whether or not we can expect any new initiatives that we could be experiencing? Sure, well, <clears throat> I think like uh, Simone and Andrea, or I think Andrea was just saying, I mean, this the, this pandemic is, is affecting everyone and everything, uh, including Design Miami, uh, but what it's done is it's uh, it, it hasn't sort of changed the world as it has uh, uh, accelerated processes that were already underway, right? So, I mean, uh, the, the theme for Design Miami Basel uh, was human nature uh, a set set a, a while back uh, before the pandemic, and of course it's taken on new meaning. Um, and for Miami, we had a theme, but now we probably have to <laughs> sort of rethink it a little bit. Um, but uh, in terms of new initiatives, um, you know, uh, I, I think we are, you know, there, well, I mean, there are, are, are certainly enough uncertainties uh, to force us all to be very sort of adaptable and flexible uh, and, and fluid uh, about our plans. So we are, of course, um, uh, going to be more active uh, in the digital realm uh, with the launch of a new uh, website in just a matter of, of, of weeks. But of course, how we do that um, will, will, of course, uh, be, be, uh, be influenced by uh, the evolution, ways in which we see the fair uh, evolving, uh, both in the short term and the, and, and the medium and, and, and long term. So hopefully uh, we'll be rolling that out in a few weeks and, and seeing how people um, uh, respond and, 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 and going from there. Well, we will all keep but, our eyes. Yeah, but I, I, I agree with, with, with Simone, what Simone and Andre were saying uh, in, answer to, in, in response to that, that last question about how people should respond. I mean, I, I think it is an individual uh, matter. And, and, and I think it is up to everyone and all organizations to sort of respond in their own way. You know, um, there's, there's no uh, one way uh, to respond. And I think a lot of people are, are, have been very quick uh, to mobilize and, and, and that's great. Um, but uh, I think it's also really good just to sort of uh, reflect uh, in the background uh, for a while as well. So like, I, I, I think people should not feel uh, that they need to uh, uh, respond so quickly without uh, having a clear idea of of, uh, of 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 where of where they and and we uh, collectively uh, collectively want to go. Well, now we might be perfectly poised for that, as we see. It's not it's not getting any better that quickly, and so we all can <laughs> keep pressing. Um, okay, I have one last question from Alexa, who is an interior design major at SCAD, and she'll be graduating at the end of the month. Um, she's interested in sustainability as it relates to materials and would like to know how you guys relate that to your specific location and whether or not you think it might be easier to push new and innovative recycling strategies in Europe as opposed to here in the US. So uh, actually, yes, it is easier because European Union is doing a better job than the US in developing uh, political responses to ecological problems. Um, uh, so in this moment, uh, despite in Europe, a lot of people hate the European Union. Um, European Union is really developing a lot of directives, which are then distributed to different countries uh, to follow up on not only recycling strategies, but on a lot of different matters. 
And I know that in the US, there's a fantastic group of activists that are doing that. But the, the US is a bit slower in reacting to this because also, I guess, of the you know, obvious political reasons. Um, nevertheless, there is, there is a lot that can, that can be done. Um, and uh, I, think the, I think as designers, we often cannot necessarily perform immediately the changes we would wish. But we can, in any case, through our work, put them forward. So for instance, when we develop war streams, it's not that the, the strategies we came, came up with, they, they have been listened or implemented by anyone. But there are, we hope that our work and our contribution is part of a larger sort of cultural shift that we are participating to. So I wouldn't say that necessarily locality is important uh, as, um, or we shouldn't be limited by locality. We should be informed by it, but not limited by it. Uh, otherwise, of course, we cannot come up with solutions. Excellent. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, I want to thank Andrea and Simone and also Arik for just joining us and hosting this conversation. It was wonderful. Um, we all loved it. Um, thank you guys for joining us here. Stay tuned for more Guest and Gusto each week throughout the quarter. And be sure to catch Flesh Beauty founder Linda Wells tomorrow at 2 p.m. We'll see you guys all next time at Guests and Gusto. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.